start uh, today's uh, session. So once again, warm welcome to everyone. Uh, today you are taking part in one of the WHO Greece uh, special events, which is a second uh, to the first one that was held uh, last Wednesday on uh, gender and immunization. And based on the feedback that we got on the chat, it was quite an interesting session. So today we'll be focusing on, uh, on the strategies for catch-up vaccination within the context of COVID-19. And we all know that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly uh, impacted immunization services all over the world. And uh, things are being done to ensure continuity of these services. That's why these special events are organized. And they are not just for uh, the Greek uh, uh, level one scholars, but extended to all immunization pro professionals. So I want to say a warm welcome to you all that are joining us uh, from all over the world for this wonderful section. I just want to say hello to Mukta Adamu that's joining us from Sumaila, from Kano in Nigeria. So uh, here are just some ground rules that we want uh, you to keep in mind that if you're just joining us, please I'm invited inviting you right now to type in your city and your country where you're connecting from in the chat so we know where you're joining us from. And we require you to participate actively. You can listen, you can give feedback in the chat, you can ask questions. So uh, we have the Q&A uh, 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 section where you can get to ask your questions. You can also comment on the presentations uh, of the presenter while uh, uh, they are speaking and uh, if you want to speak, you request to speak, uh, you uh, just have to select the raise hand uh, icon on your screen and it will give you the possibility to speak. I've seen a lot of people in the chat, they're typing in their city and their country and their message is addressed only to the panelists. Please, when you're sending out your message, make sure it's addressed to all panelists and attendees so that everyone in the room will be able to see the message that you have typed in. And I want to say a warm welcome to Uma Zakariao from Nigeria. Your message was addressed only to the panelists. Uh, please, when you send a message, address all panelists and attendees so that everyone that's in the room will be able to see it. And I say uh, hi to Bridget Job Johnson that's joining us from Tajikistan. Also, I talked earlier about the Q&A. So you have the Q&A uh, icon on your screen, whether you're using the computer or your uh, uh, smartphone. So you can get to, if you want to ask a question, you click uh, uh, on that icon and ask your question. You can also comment on other people's questions. And you also have the opportunity to vote for the most uh, 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 the question that you find most pertinent because uh, the, uh, by clicking on the thumbs up button, uh, under the question that is asked. If you do so, the questions that will get the highest votes will be addressed uh, by uh, the subject matter experts. And so during, throughout the presentation, we are going to be getting uh, some polls. You'll be asked a few questions, rapid questions, uh, less than a minute. So when the time comes, uh, if uh, the, the polls uh, pops up on your screen, just answer as quickly as possible and then go to the next section. So uh, today, uh, the resources, many of you are asking about the slide decks and the resources for the, for, for the session. Uh, they are, will be made available for you. I'm just um, uh, sharing the link to the resources uh, on the chat right now. So for you to have access to the resources for the special events, you just need to click on the direct link. So at the end of the presentation, we are going to have uh, an open uh, dialogue with you. Those who have questions, you just raise your hand and uh, you ask the, your question. So I don't want to speak much. Uh, we already have uh, the subject uh, matter experts here with us and I'm going to turn uh, my attention towards them. I want to recognize uh, the presence of uh, Jamil Bao from WHO HQ and uh, also uh, the members of the scholar team, uh, Reda is here with Oza and Alain Blaise. But I will turn my attention now to our guests of the day. Uh, that's Stephanie Shendal and uh, Sami Soda from WHO. They are going to introduce themselves and uh, tell us what they do. And then they'll have the floor for the presentation. Over to you, Stephanie, and then Samir. Thank you, Charlotte. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can get you five on five. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. Really nice to see so much participation from all across the globe today. Um, welcome to all the GRISP scholars and, of course, all the extra special guests that have joined us today. Um, my name is Stephanie Shendell. For those of you who don't know me, I work um, at WHO HQ in Geneva in the Essential Program on Immunization in the Life Course and Integration team. Um, and I'm going to be uh, presenting this subject today with my colleague, Samir Soda, so I'll, I'll hand it over to him to introduce himself now before we get started. Hi, everyone. So this is Samir Soda. I also work in WHOHQ um, in Geneva in the Essential Program of Immunizations, but I work on the program strengthening team uh, along with Stephanie as well. So good to, ha good to be here and happy to see so many people participating. All right, so thank you, Sami and Stephanie. So right now, I'll invite Stephanie to share our screen. While she's presenting, if you have any comments, remember typing your comments in the chat, your questions in the Q&A section. Over to you, Stephanie. Um, thank you so much, Charlotte. Sorry, even though we did this test before this has started, I'm somehow losing my presenter mode, so. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, welcome, and today we're gonna talk about strategies for catch-up vaccination. And of course, given that we're in the middle of um, this COVID-19 pandemic, we will frame the conversation in the context of COVID-19 as appropriate. Um, so I know we have a lot to cover today, and I want to make sure that we leave enough time for Q&A at the end. So just to give a brief overview of what we're going to talk about in the session today, um, we'll give it a little bit of a background, set the stage a little bit around the, as Charlotte already alluded to, um, the service interruptions that we're experiencing as a result of COVID-19 and what that means for immunization and immunization coverage. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is actually meant by catch-up vaccination and why this is such an important topic. Um, and then I want to give an overview to everybody of the new WHO guidance that has recently been published on catch-up vaccination and some of the key points that are highlighted in that guidance for immunization programs. And then the second half of the presentation, we're gonna talk more about the actual catch-up strategies that can be conducted uh, both during and following COVID to address some of the gaps that have been created in these programs now and include, of course, um, some points on the safe delivery of immunization services during the pandemic and some issues to consider when selecting which strategies to use for catch-up, what combination of strategies to use and what programs can think about when they're um, trying to address this very critical issue. So just, you know, for a little bit of a background, um, of course, we all know that unfortunately, we are experiencing some pretty serious um, service interruptions to all essential health services, not only immunization, but including immunization. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this is both in the routine program and also due to the delay or suspension of mass vaccination campaigns that were otherwise planned and have had to be um, either temporarily canceled or, or postponed as a result of COVID. We're seeing this because of, you know, a combination of factors, really. There's the social distancing and, um, and restrictions that have been put in place in many countries, which are making it more difficult to access health services, transportation reductions, et cetera. And then, of course, there's also a lot of concerns, both on the, uh, on the part of the caregivers and individuals to access health services, as well as the health workers in ensuring that they can deliver these services safely in the context of a, you know, an ongoing pandemic. We've seen supply chain interruptions and delays, which are creating challenges for programs um, in terms of stockouts of vaccines and related supplies. And all of this means that, um, you know, unfortunately, the populations and the high, the high risk populations that were already at an increased risk for inequities prior to this, it's now really being exacerbated, you know, both in terms of the COVID morbidity and mortality that these populations are experiencing, but also because they're being disproportionately affected by a lot of the, um, the ramifications of this pandemic, such as the economic fallout, et cetera. So it's just, you know, heightening the need to make sure that we're paying attention to these high risk groups even more. This is a slide that some of you might have seen before. This is the most recent version of it. This is the result of um, a rapid pulse survey that was conducted of essential health services across all countries in the world. This is responses from 124 countries. Um, just to get an idea of the extent of interruption that we're seeing in these, um, in, you know, all across, as I said, the essential health services spectrum. I've highlighted here the two lines that reflect the immunization delivery, both through outreach services and routine. And as you can see, in over half of the countries that responded to the survey, they're experiencing a pretty significant um, service interruption, or at least a partial interruption of, you know, between 5 and 50% of service reduction in over half of the countries. And so this isn't a small problem. This is happening everywhere. And we do know that it's going to result in some 
implications for immunization coverage, um, you know, both in the months of the peak of the pandemic and as this situation continues. Uh, and so to help provide guidance for countries on how to, you know, safely maintain essential services to the maximum extent possible during the pandemic, WHO has published a large number of technical guidance materials. They're all available on the WHO website. Specifically with respect to immunization, there are a number of guidance documents available as well. Um, and of course, immunization is an essential health service that, that should be uh, maintained to the extent possible. So it's included in all the guidance on core, um, and on core health services. And this, um, this one particular document, Guiding Principles for Immunization Activities During the COVID-19 Pandemic, uh, this is an important document that covers you know, how to safely maintain service delivery throughout the, the ongoing pandemic. And this document is currently under revision. We're expecting a new version to come out um, towards the end of next week or the following. So keep your eye out for that because it's going to be updated shortly. But I just want to step back for a second. I know it's hard to kind of remove yourself from the COVID-19 discussion, but I just want to step back for a second and say, now we're talking about catch up and people missing immunizations because of COVID-19 interruptions, but fine. But all of us work in immunization and we all know that in fact, there are actually a wide number of reasons why individuals miss out on their vaccines. And some of you might be familiar with the missed opportunities for vaccination strategy. It's a WHO strategy that looks at reasons why individuals miss out on vaccines that they're eligible for while they're actually in the health centers for a variety of other reasons. And this diagram um, shows a summary of findings from missed opportunity for vaccination assessment that have conducted in a lot of countries. And as you can see that there are many reasons across the board, health systems issues, health worker practices, caregiver attitudes and practices that contribute to you know, individuals missing out on their schedule of vaccines. So this is not a new problem. This is a problem that exists all over the world um, to varying degrees. And you know, the same reasons that uh, contribute to individuals missing out on their vaccines also sometimes contribute to them not being able to actually get those vaccines as catch up. And so when we talk about catch-up vaccination, both today and in general, it's you know it's a it's kind of a word that's thrown around a lot now. But when we talk about vaccination, what do we real catch-up vaccination? What do we really mean? And we're really referring to vaccinating individuals who miss for any reason the vaccine for which they are eligible per the immunization schedule. So you know, referring back to the previous slide, this could be for a variety of reasons, and. This really highlights the importance of being able to ensure that a catch-up strategy is in place to make sure that those individuals have a chance to get those vaccines at a later date. Now, this is not a new concept. This is not a new recommendation either. WHO has a number of strategies for strengthening routine immunization that are all really centered around the ability to offer catch-up. So the missed opportunities for vaccination that I mentioned already, the second year of life platform, um, which hopefully some of you are also familiar with, really focuses on making sure that, you know, contacts in the second year of life are also an opportunity to catch up um, infants on, on vaccines that they have missed in the previous year. Um, school vaccination checks, which are widely recommended, that's essentially introducing another opportunity to catch up uh, vaccination for children who have missed out on certain doses. So these are not new recommendations, but of course, now, you know, when you have a, an emergency situation that we're experiencing now where there is an interruption of services, it really highlights, it puts a spotlight on the importance of catch-up vaccination. And so a lot of countries already do have catch-up strategies in place, and they're going to be sort of at a head start now when they're dealing with these larger gaps that are created by COVID. But for those countries who don't already have these types of strategies in place, now is really the time to be thinking about them. And so in order to support countries who are looking to establish or for those countries that have um, certain strategies in place, but maybe not across the whole spectrum and are looking to strengthen it, WHO just recently published some guidance um, on catch-up vaccination. This is the document, it's called Leave No One Behind, Guidance for Planning and Implementing Catch-Up. And this guidance is really centered around that theme that catch-up vaccination is an essential part of routine immunization delivery and it should be in place for all programs on an ongoing basis, not only when you're dealing with an emergency situation, but all the time. And uh, the guidance covers sort of considerations and the systems enablers 
that should be in place across all aspects of the routine immunization program to better allow systems to deliver catch-up vaccination to individuals. The guidance is split into two parts. The first part really focuses on those key policy and programmatic considerations across, as I said, all aspects of the immunization program. And then the second part deals with exacerbated circumstances, situations such as what we find ourselves in today, where there is an emergency situation, but it's not only a pandemic, it could be due to any sort of like mass conflict, um, population displacements, natural disasters. I mean, for any reason where there's a systemic interruption in the immunization program for any period of time, that's going to create you know, a pause or an interruption of services and the extra special efforts that might be needed in those cases. But that's all in addition to those principles that are covered in the first part, which should be underlying you know, system issues in place that can allow you know, for catch-up vaccination at any time. And so this webinar is also going to be sort of divided into two parts in a way because I want to spend the first time, the first half of it talking a little bit about these system enablers that I keep mentioning. And then, as I said, the second half will be, you know, dealing with a little bit more of the acute situation that we're facing right now, where we know that there are ongoing efforts to try to catch up individuals who have been missed due to the COVID-19 situation. So just pause for a second. We're going to do a quick pulse check. I know there's people on, on the line from all over the world and Countries are all facing very, very different situations right now. So I just want to know from those on the call, prior to the pandemic, so pre-COVID, did your country already have an official written catch-up vaccination policy in place? Yes or no? And did your country have a catch-up schedule in place? And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between these things next, but I just would like to know on the call what we're looking at right now. Okay, for now we have about 30 participants in the room that have taken the 35. So please just go ahead and answer yes or no. And then uh, in exactly one minute, we are going to end the poll. Okay, so it actually looks like we're, you know, we have a really good mix. It looks like about 50 50 each. See, it still looks like there's some people answering. Um, but so far we're split pretty much down the middle, um, which is good and kind of highlights the point that like, you know, there's, there's a wide variety in circumstances out there and um, programs gonna, are going to be starting at a very different place. So over um, a third, okay, so just end of the poll. Okay. I can't see, can you guys see the results now? So I've just uh, shared the results. I don't know if you can. I can see them, but I just can't see if, if everyone can see them. So uh, yeah, it looks like, as I said, about half and half. Okay, so it's, it's, it's gonna be a quite, a, quite a big mix and um, it'll be interesting to hear during the Q&A sort of what the different issues that are facing the programs that are starting at different places around this particular. So half of you on this call, you know, already have this, this down, but of course the starting point for all of this is to ensure that you actually have a catch-up vaccination policy and schedule in place. And so uh, national immunization technical advisory groups or other advisory groups are going to be central to this kind of process because it's going to require potentially some policy revision at the national level. Not only is it important to have a clarifying policy that enables catch-up vaccination, but it's also important to review existing policies to make sure that there's nothing that's actually preventing catch-up vaccination from happening. Um, because we know that, you know, what we've seen through um, situations in a lot of countries that sometimes there's actually restrictive, you know, age caps in place that actually don't allow vaccination beyond certain age groups. And so, of course, that would prevent the ability to catch up individuals who have missed out before that age cap. Um, there might be multi-dose vial policies or limitations on multi-dose vial policies that you know, would prevent health workers from opening um, vials to provide catch-up vaccination, limitations on where or when vaccinating takes place. All of these things can contribute to you know, missed opportunities for vaccination and preventing catch-up. So you really need to think about the policy framework 
um, as a whole and making sure that there are enabling and not any prohibitive policies in place that would prevent vaccination, um, catch up vaccination from happening. Now, just one quick point, given that we are in an emergency situation now, and so um, there may not be time to undertake an entire uh, lengthy policy revision process. Um, so a consideration for certain situations like now, for example, would be to consider issuing interim guidance, temporary lifting of age cutoffs, for example, to make sure that people who have been missed during these COVID interruptions have the ability to be caught up. But of course, that's with a view to making sure that these are institutionalized going forward. So what is a catch-up vaccination policy? What should it really provide clarity on? And these are just a couple of the things that we really would hope to see in such a policy so that those who are responsible for actually delivering vaccination have you know, a very clear idea of what is and isn't permissible. So it really should stress the importance of providing vaccinations for those who have missed and run their doses, how to determine the eligibility, including permissible age ranges, what to do if vaccination history cannot be confirmed, because unfortunately that is a, a problem sometimes, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little later on, the importance of the data systems, um, but the correct recording and reporting of delayed doses, um, and the leveraging of every health contact as an opportunity to check vaccination history. And this is something that is going to be even more important now as we see inter intermittent interruptions due to this COVID interruption that, you know, checking vaccination history at every health contact, not only immunization contacts, can really contribute to, you know, miss, uh, catching some individuals who might have otherwise slipped through the cracks. So WHO already has recommendations for um, interrupted and delayed immunization. As I said earlier, this isn't a new recommendation. This is something that's been in place for a long time. Um, this is the summary table, which shows clearly that um, the, the, the things that you would need to be considering when implementing uh, catch-up vaccination policy and schedule. And so there, it can be found at that link. This is not something that's intended to be used directly by health workers, or this is not a catch-up schedule in itself, but rather this is a tool that can be used by um, policymakers and just uh, policymakers and decision makers on developing or revising the national immunization policies and schedules in their own country according to their own schedule of vaccines. But the key thing is that catch-up schedules will need to be understandable by health workers. And so of course they need to include the age cohorts to which those catch-up schedules apply, including the minimum and maximum upper age limits if there is such a, um, such a limit as per national policy. And the key thing is clear directives on the minimum intervals permissible, permissible between doses for each antigen. And so the other thing to keep in mind is that as immunization programs expand across the life course, there's going to become a need for multiple catch-up schedules for different target populations and age groups because the number of doses, in, for some antigens, the number of doses needed and the spacing between the doses will be different if you're dealing with you know, a child under two versus you know, a child at seven years old or of course an adolescent or an adult. And so as we expand the vaccination across the life course, we also need to be thinking about how to catch up all the individuals at those different stages. So there's not really a clear sort of template for a catch-up schedule because of course, all countries have different immunization schedules and different target groups. So I just wanted to provide a couple of examples here to show sort of the variations in approaches. And in the WHO guidance on catch up, there are links to a bunch of other examples. And of course, you guys might have some additional examples to share as part of the discussion later. But here's just an example on the on the on the right, we have an example from Malaysia. And the way that they have done it is they've actually shown in these columns, as you can see, um, the different things that are needed for catch up if you present to the health system at you know different ages whereas the example on the left is an example from the indian academy of Pediat uh, pediatrics recommendation and i like the way that they've done it because they can you can see that you know there's the the recommended age for actual vaccination and then the green bars show the permissible ranges for catch up so you can see that actually bcg if you you know the idea is to deliver it at birth but they've recommended that even if you come up to five years of age, you can still get vaccinated with BCG. So this is, a, this is clearly understandable by health workers, you know, what they're allowed to do, give, what they should be giving, and which children are still eligible for vaccines up to what ages. So that kind of brings me to my next point. You know, policy and procedures are only as good as the people who implement them. And um, it can be confusing. There's lots of different vaccines and schedules these days. And, um, 
for a health worker to be able to, you know, assess the eligibility of an individual that pre that presents to them and know, you know, which vaccines they can give and when, uh, there needs to be appropriate training in place. And so the importance is actually building health worker knowledge and practice around catch up. And this is in some places not something that is, you know, an institutionalized practice. There's a lot of underlying attitudes and practices that might need to be undone or shifted in thinking around expanding vaccination into, you know, older age groups or above the, the target ages. And so training should really emphasize that and screening for eligibility, the minimum intervals between doses, how to record the late doses, managing multiple injections, um, all of these things are important to, to include in the training when you know, building the health worker knowledge and practice around catch-up vaccination. But the key, the key thing is to enforce the principle that it's better to vaccinate late than never. And so, you know, as I said, this is not always something that's done everywhere, and that's gonna you know, require a lot of supportive supervision and strengthening these, these concepts and practices. Job aids can help this a lot, and there are some good examples out there. Uh, I mentioned the 2IL platform earlier, and so when we developed the guidance on 2IL, we included some example of job aids, and those can be adapted to the immunization schedules of any country. Um, and we also have some really good training materials in the 2IL guidance that can also be adapted to, um, you know, expand to ages beyond that second year platform, because it's really around reinforcing the concept of um, being able to screen for eligibility and provide catch up vac vaccination when they're due. So those are available at the in the 2IL um, website, the link is there. There are also a lot of really good innovative examples out there from other countries um, that can be used for, for this, this circumstance. So there's a, an app called Catch Up Ghana, which helps health workers in Ghana interpret um, immunization schedules and assess eligibility when, when children come in. Um, there are a lot of different online tools available in higher income settings. This is, a, is an example from Australia. But these types of things can be developed by countries adapted to their own national immunization schedule, of course, that can serve to help health workers because it is quite challenging sometimes for health workers and we have to understand that. And so trying to make it as easy as possible through providing this and, and as I said, supportive supervision is really key. Um, another point that is a concern and understandably in a lot of places is, is managing multiple injections because the idea is to catch up anyone as quickly as possible. And if an individual is missing, you know, one or two doses of a prior vaccine when they come in for another vaccine, you know, we're just adding on additional injections at that same visit. And that can provide concern or can create concern, totally understandable. Um, so the idea is just making sure that health workers are feeling comfortable and equipped to deal with any concerns from parents or individuals, and that they themselves also feel comfortable delivering multiple injections at the same time. Multiple injections are safe to be delivered together, and it's also better because it reduces the number of visits that's required for that person to get caught up. But it is a concern in a lot of places, and so it's worth flagging here. But I also just wanted to show that you know, this is just a recent assessment based on JRF data um, of just the immunization schedules across the world. And these are routine schedules, but it's also, it's also worth acknowledging that it's really quite common practice all across the world to deliver multiple vaccinations at a single visit. And so I think it's normalizing it and again, making sure that health workers are really, really comfortable with it themselves so that they can communicate that and reassure caregivers and, and parents of the safety and acceptability of that. Uh, but of course, the idea is never to really force anybody to take as many vaccines at, at one time as they, as they can. I mean, if there's really, really a concern, it's really about training the health workers to be able to manage that dialogue and, um, and agree on a solution with that individual. Okay, so that was a lot of information, but I just wanna stop again and ask a few questions. Um, you know, these are some examples of what, you know, any health worker might face on a, on a given day. And so, you know, just to see from the audience how you guys would handle it if you were a health worker. Um, imagine that a child comes in at 15 months old. And this is a country that measles vaccination is given at nine and 15 months. So child comes in at 15 months and they have no history of measles vaccine. If you were a health worker, what would you do? Would you turn the child away because they're too old to receive MCV1 at that point? Would you vaccinate but record it as MCV2 because they're at the age that MCV2 is due? Or would you vaccinate and record it as MCV1 and then tell the care worker to come back in four weeks for their second dose of measles? OK, 
Okay, so far we have uh, 51 people that have already voted. Please, you're encouraged to at just select one answer. And uh, in 12, 10 seconds, we are going to stop and polling. Okay. And these are, this is, these are real life, these are real life challenges, so. Yeah, so you see, two thirds of the participants, over two thirds of the participants have already responded to the poll. So Stephanie, uh, if you want, we could end the poll now. Okay, yeah, I think we can, end, we can end the poll now. We're getting a pretty clear majority. Okay. Are you projecting into the answer? Okay. Yeah, so let me share the results. So the good news is that the vast majority of respondents answered this correctly to vaccinate and recorded as MCV1. But I mean, this is not, this is not so straightforward for every health worker, especially in countries where vac the catch up vaccination is not already an institutionalized policy. So it's understandable that this type of thing can be confusing. And also sometimes contributing to this confusion is the way that the data is collected in the country. So I do see that some people incorrectly um, responded that they should record as MCV2. So we're gonna talk about that in a few slides as well, but just to highlight that this isn't necessarily so easy for all health workers to understand without the appropriate training. So one more question. Penta, given at six, 10, 14 weeks, Imagine a child comes in, they've received Penta 1 and Penta 2 on time, but six months has passed since the last visit. So you're the health worker. What do you do in this case? Do you turn the child away because too much time has passed and they're no longer eligible for their third dose? Do you vaccinate and record it as Penta 3? Or do you restart the whole series again as, as Penta 1? It's like we aren't getting you clearly now, uh, Stephanie. You're not getting me, you can't hear me clearly. Oh, that's better now. We lost okay. the volume of your headset for a moment. So we have uh, over 50% of our participants that have already uh, voted. Okay. We can close it at the minute mark on this one. Okay. Because again, it looks like there's a good majority. Um, looks like there's a very, very good majority that answered this one correctly. Of course, vaccinate the, the child with the third dose and record it as Penta 3. Um, it doesn't matter how much time has passed since the last dose of Penta, they're still eligible for a third dose and it should still be recorded as Penta 3. So that's correct. Okay, and one more question in this series of polls. So this one's about HPV, which presents slightly different challenges. So imagine two doses are given at school, one in grade five, one in grade six, so 12 months apart. Due to COVID-19 school closures, it's now been more than 12 months since the girls in these grades received their first dose. When the school-based programs resume, whenever that may be, what should you do? Do you restart the series again with HPV-1? Do you vaccinate the girls that are due for their second dose and record it as HPV2? There's no maximum interval for HPV. Or do you not vaccinate these girls because 12 months have passed and they no longer need the second dose? Okay, looks like we're getting a good selection here. But Charlotte, we can close it in a minute again because it looks like a lot of people. All right. Okay, a few more and minutes. There are, some people that are, there are some people that are answering in the chat. Okay, so, I can't see the chat, so I'll leave that to you to monitor. Okay, again, we have people that have answered all different ones, which highlights that this isn't necessarily so clear cut without the right training. But the good news is that most people answered correctly. The answer is B, there is no maximum interval for HPV. So Always, you know, if someone comes and hasn't received their second dose and at least five months has passed, which is the minimum interval, vaccinate that, that child because um, they still need the second dose and it's never too late to get the second dose. So, okay. So that was just to highlight some of these challenges that, you know, we shouldn't take it with a grain of salt that it's so easy for, 
frontline workers to be able to make these decisions. And that really highlights the importance of providing the proper tools and training to support them. But another thing that can really help health workers to be able to make these decisions is by having the recording and reporting practices and tools in place in the countries to support that. And what I mean by that is that recording late doses can be a real challenge. And we've seen this in a lot of places uh, where systems aren't currently designed to capture doses given late. And that can sometimes lead to unintended consequences of you know, individuals being turned away for vaccination because the way that the data tools are set up sort of represents an idea that you know, once you're past a certain age, it's too late to get that vaccine. So the key takeaway from this is that recording important tools should never signal that late vaccination is undesirable. There should always be a way so that these types of, uh, so that catch-up vaccination can be somehow recorded and reported. And so this, this applies to tally sheets, monthly summary reports, and immunization records and home-based records. All of the, the data recording tools should be set up in a way so that health workers don't have to make up their own solutions when they're faced with a situation where they need to vaccinate an individual and there's no space for that to be put onto these tools. And so to highlight that example a little bit, or to show, to illustrate it rather, um, I'm just gonna show you this example. So imagine that a child comes in at two and a half years old and they've only received one dose of measles. This health worker knows that a second dose of measles is needed. She wants to give it to that child, but this is what the tally sheet looks like in that country. So where should she record the dose? You know, you have this column that is, has a closed endpoint of 12 to 23 months. And if this kid is two and a half, and this health worker is now faced with a confusing situation where she doesn't know where she should record that dose. She doesn't want to not record it because then it might get you know, thrown into the wastage calculation. She wants to give it the dose and she wants to keep track of it, but she doesn't know how. So this is what I mean by having tools that are prohibitive rather than supportive. An easier way to have this or otherwise identical tally sheet is to just have an open-ended column that allows for late vaccination if they're beyond that that 12 month cutoff. If, if, a, if a program is really concerned with more granular capturing of timeliness, then you can divide this into multiple columns and that's fine. But the key message is that the, there should always be an open-ended option so that health workers aren't forced to improvise their solutions. And then the flip side of this importance of data, um, of data information systems is actually being able to, to know what individuals are eligible for, what the individual vaccination history is. Um, and that really shows that you know, reliable written record, whether it's a home-based record or facility registries or in countries that have electronic immunization registers, this is really essential for determining you know, what your individual history is and whether or not you need any vaccines that day. And so the idea of emphasizing that all vaccines should be recorded and reported in the home-based records and that individuals should bring home-based records to every single health contact can really facilitate, you know, both from the individual and the health worker side to, you know, assessing eligibility and knowing which vaccines to give, you know, at what time. So again, just thinking about, you know, the fact that we're in the middle of a situation where some of these policies may need to be rolled out faster. Um, if the tools in your country are not currently designed to capture late vaccination, but you know that because of COVID, you're going to need to be able to capture late vaccination, um, a suggestion is to you know, suggest a standard practice so that at least all health workers are doing the same thing and making sure that they're notated in the home-based records because ultimately later on, um, the best way to assess coverage is through coverage surveys and the best way to know what your accurate coverage is through these surveys is if you actually have um, good home-based record retention. And so making sure that those records are in the home-based records, even if there isn't a space to record late doses, um, just highlight the importance of making sure that they're documented no matter what. Um, okay, so just one point on supply, because I know that this is probably a concern for some people on this call, simply because it comes up in conversation so often when we're talking about implementing catch-up policies new and um, extending the opportunity for vaccination to older age groups. Um, programs are worried about stockouts and whether or not this is going to lead to supply issues for their, their vaccine programs. And this might be true. I mean, I know that some programs do their forecasts based on prior consumption. And so if you don't previously have a policy that allows for late vaccination and you're introducing that, you might see a temporary surge 
in uh, consumption in, in the first few months of introducing a policy. But just to reassure people that the recommended buffer stock should really account for this. And so making sure that forecasts are constantly revised based on actual consumption and including that additional buffer stock on top of that should really mitigate these little fluctuations that might occur when introducing these new policies. I mean, the key point to remember is that you're offering catch-up vaccination to individuals who are already do these vaccines. So they would have been included in your original forecast or at least in your original, original budgeting for that target population. And you're just now allowing those individuals to get the vaccines that they are entitled to. And is it, so this shouldn't consume extra vaccine for in, any individual. It's really just a matter of, um, you know, the fact that they might get it at a different time. You don't have to restart vaccination as those previous poll question examples highlighted, you don't need to restart it. So you're not revaccinating the same individuals multiple times. You're just giving them the ones that they already should have gotten. And you know, another point to consider when programs are concerned about you know, overconsumption is that by offering catch-up vaccination to older cohorts, this may actually contribute to reduced wastage because for some vials like measles, BCG yellow fever, where you have to discard them at the end of the session, um, by allowing vaccination of, you know, an old, like older age groups who might also be present in the facility that day, you may actually contribute to decreasing your wastage in a given session. Um, and so just one quick point, this is nothing that I want to harbor on too much because um, we'll revisit communi communications later on in the COVID side section, but um, it's also a matter of changing attitudes in the communities. And so messaging should really be, you know, of course, it's important to come on time. We want to promote timely vaccination to the extent we can. We want individuals to get vaccinated due on the schedule in the country. But messaging should also be that it's better late than never. And so if you have missed a vaccine for any reason, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're not eligible. Caregivers shouldn't be concerned or worried about you know, coming into a health center because they're too late and they might get turned away or berated. Um, it's still safe and effective to vaccinate beyond the target age group. And the, the key message is that bring your home-based record to every visit so that health workers can see whether any vaccines have been missed and offer the capture vaccination effectively. So that's like really the main thing that should be communicated to the communities. Okay, so <laughs> now I'm just gonna talk about some actual strategies for capture vaccination. And I say during and following COVID because as we said earlier on, you know, COVID's not the only reason that individuals miss their vaccines. A lot of these things should be in place anyways and should continue to be in place even after you know, we come out the other end of this pandemic. And if programs don't already have a lot of these strategies in place now, and they're starting to put them into place because of COVID, then keeping these things in an ongoing basis in the future will just serve to strengthen the program because you know, this is not gonna be the last time that we have an interruption like this. And it's just really important time to sort of look at your systems and, and make the appropriate strengthening that, that's necessary. And so in the guide and in our presentation today, we'll kind of talk about um, a variety of different tactics that can be used for captive vaccination, both as part of the ongoing everyday routine immunization program, and then a couple of extra sort of specialized efforts that might be required in the event of a service interruption. And so here's a couple of, of the things that we'll talk about next, but I am going to turn it over to Samir now to um, take you through the second half of the presentation. So Samir, over to you. Okay, Hi. thank you very much, Stephanie. Samir, before you come in, I just wanted to remind uh, the participants in the room that you could vote for the question that you want to see answered, the most relevant question. So you just go towards the Q&A. And I see there are lots of questions there without any vote. So you just uh, uh, give a thumbs up to the question that you find most relevant to you and that you want to see answered. And you can also continue to ask your own questions. And I want to thank uh, Carolina for answering some of the questions that are coming up on the chat and defining some terms. Okay, over to you, Sami. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Stephanie, next slide, please. So before we begin and start discussing um, catch-up vaccination strategies in the context of COVID, it's very important that we first establish that we need to make sure and ensure that vaccination is being delivered safely, safe for the health worker, safe for the recipient, and safe for the caregiver as well. And to do that, we need to implement appropriate IPC measures and ensure that there's um, personal protective equipment 
that's available and utilized, and that their physical distancing, measure, distancing measures put in place as well. So some adaptations programs can do to accommodate some of these um, issues. One, you can modify service hours to allow for increases in patient flow. You can physically separate immunization services from other treatment areas, which is critically important to be able to separate our generally healthy populations of immunization away from potentially contagious populations in the curative services area. You can schedule appointments to avoid overcrowding, but it's important that this helps with you know, decreasing crowding. We do not want to deter anyone from um, getting vaccinated. So if anyone still comes without an appointment, we would encourage that person to still be vaccinated. And you can also assign specific service hours for certain population groups so they can control and stagger um, the amount of people are getting vaccination services during a visit. Next slide, please. So it's important to realize that hand hygiene is recommended is a recommended practice between each recipient before and after contact. And in terms of personal protective equipment, masks are, requ are recommended in areas where there's COVID-19 community transmission, but they can also be considered in settings where you have sporadic cases or clusters. Eye protection gloves and gowns are not, routine requ not routinely required except for special circumstances. Next slide, please. So hand hygiene is critically important. I'm not gonna, just so you know, we have a lot of slides in this presentation. It's a very dense presentation by deliberate design so that you can use this as a reference down the road. But because of time, we won't be able to cover every slide in detail. But for this particular slide about hand hygiene, I just wanna highlight at the bottom, the mention that there's now WHO UNICEF um, um, new guidelines on WASH that provides guidelines and interim recommendations on hand hygiene. And so the link is there at the bottom in case you wanted um, Look, look at it for more information. Next slide, please. And similarly, we don't have time to go into detail about all the IPC recommendations for immunization during COVID-19, but I just wanna highlight for all of you that we did have a webinar in May that covered this topic and you can go to that link. They have access to the recording, the slides and additional resources. And in addition, in the Immunization Academy, we have three excellent videos that have been made about IPC for immunization in the COVID context. And these videos are also available in English, French, and Spanish. So they're an important reference. I would recommend everyone to watch these videos. Next slide, please. So once you are able to ensure that you're able to provide safe vaccination delivery um, in your program, now we can start thinking about how to offer catch-up vaccination. So just to highlight what Stephanie emphasized earlier, catch-up immunization should be an ingrained strategy and policy within every immunization program. So for the next three slides, these are three principles and practices that every program should have in place. But in the COVID context, these are things that we need to pay special attention to to make sure that they are being practiced. So first, you need to incorporate opportunities for catch up at every immunization contact visit. So that means that it, whether it be fixed outreach or even school based delivery platforms at each of these visits, the health worker needs to check the vaccination status of the child and ensure that there's catch-up doses provided for any antigens that are missed. This basically requires that the health workers are routinely and regularly checking the immunization cards, the, the home-based records, and that similarly the caregivers know to bring those home-based records to every, every immunization visit. And it's important to point out here that you can see why the home-based records are a critical piece of the whole catch-up strategy. And so it's important to ensure there's availability of home-based records as well. For some programs, this is a challenge, and I would, this would be a time to start thinking about how you want to address these challenges if you want to have a successful catch-up immunization strategy. But if you really think about it, this principle or this practice to incorporate catch-up at every immunization visit, it really is the bare minimum we should expect out of all our immunization programs. Really what we should expect is that um, there's opportunities to provide vaccination at every health visit, not just every immunization visit. And every time we miss vaccinating a child at a health visit, it is a missed opportunity for vaccination. Next slide, please. So we really have a, need to have a cognizant effort, a deliberate effort to try to reduce these missed opportunities for vaccination. And the principles are the same as before. We, we need to remind the caregivers to bring the, the home-based record to every health visit. And you need to make sure that the health workers are checking and screening these home-based records at every visit. The difference here is that we're not restricting this now to immunization health workers, but to other program areas as well, such as in the prenatal, postnatal, and primary care areas as well. 
So once they are screened in these visits and these non-immunization visits, ideally they should be vaccinated if they're missing any vaccines. But if that's not logistically feasible, they should at least be referred to the immunization area to receive those vaccines. And this can be done in different ways based on your local context. Um, just as an example, in the picture on the right, you can see a slip of paper that there's a picture of there. That's an example of a referral token in, that's being used in some facilities in DR Congo right now. So when a child goes to a non-immunization visit and they've been screened and been noted to be missing some vaccines, the health worker fills out this referral token, ident identifies which vaccines are missing, provides it to the caregiver who then takes the, the child over to the immunization side to receive those vaccines during that same day and visit. Next slide, please. So the third principle that, we've, that every program should have in place at all times is a system to track and follow up all those children who are missed. So that means tracking and follow up, follow up of the defaulters, defaulter tracking, as well as tracking newborns as well. And this is critically important right now during the COVID situation um, because we wanna make sure that no one's getting missed and slipping through the system at this point in time, more so than before. Once you have a system in place to track all of these children, you need to also think of a system of how to call them back. And it's, it's more critical now because in many, in many settings, there's a large number of children need to be caught up at this point in time. So you can consider issuing mass callbacks, or in other words, having information campaigns to remind people to come back for the vaccines. This can occur through very targeted communication, such as, such as phone calls, emails, text messages, or WhatsApp messages to those specific families who have had children, who have children who have missed vaccinations, or it could be through wider communication mes messaging, such as through the internet and social media, through conventional media, such as newspapers, radio, television, um, through community mobilizers, which would be particularly important in rural areas. Um, and it's also important for us to engage our partners in trying to deliver these communication messages. So that would include NGOs as well as professional societies as well. Next slide, please. So our next poll question, in your country of work, have any targeted communication campaigns, social and or traditional media been launched to encourage people to return for vaccination services? So I'm actually launching the poll. Uh, unfortunately, my internet connectivity is a little bit slow. So I hope it's going to come on uh, in a few seconds. There we go. Okay. So while the polling is going on, I just want to recognize all the wonderful comments that are coming in on the chat. Uh, there are people that are thanking Stephanie for the presentation, the same wonderful presentation. And then there are some people asking questions and we are getting responses and uh, experience sharing. So I just want to encourage you after voting, you may want to throw your eye on the chat to see uh, what is being said. And at the moment, this uh, quite, uh, we had 63% of uh, the participants in the room who have already voted. So at the one minute mark, I'm going to end the polling. So you can see from the results that most of you have had some sort of communication campaign or messaging that's gone out to the communities to let them know that services have returned. Um, it shows that most of you, and, and I'm sure all of you, have been very much thinking about strategies to, to get children back into the system and to catch them up. So it's good to see that. So what I've just covered are those few principles and practices that all programs need to have in place even before COVID. But now what I wanna go over is that in the current situation, we need to have a little more flexibility in how we approach catch up and allow new, new things to occur, new innovations to allow us to reach more children given the extraordinary circumstances that we're in. So one thing we can do is expand our outreach and mobile posts. Um, you can do that by updating your outreach calendar based on micro planning with information from communities. So basically if you have um, certain communities that have been more affected by disruptions, or you have certain communities that are more vulnerable because of pre-existing um, 
low coverage in those communities and at higher risk, you can adjust your outreach calendar to have more additional outreach sessions in those communities to help address the catch up needs of those communities. But beyond the geographical adjustment of expanding your outreach, you can also expand your outreach to include wider ages. So Stephanie spent a lot of time discussing the importance of expanding your age group potentially for catch up opportunities. And I think that would apply to your outreach strategies as well. In addition, you can consider innovative strategies. So just as an example in the picture here on the left, you can see an example of drive through immunization that's occurring in Abu Dhabi. And we know this is occurring in, um, in other settings as well, in many countries in the Pahu region as well. Um, you can also consider alternative locations such as pharmacy, schools, daycares, and open air markets. I think it's important to note that to be innovative, it doesn't have to be this brand new idea that globally no one has ever thought of before. It just needs to be innovative for your community. So it's, you know, school-based immunization may not be a new concept globally, but it may be new for your local setting. And so for that case, it is still an innovation that will create more opportunities for more children to be vaccinated. Um, you can consider door-to-door -door immunization activities as well, but you need, in, given the COVID situation, we need to make sure that there's safety measures that are taken into account as well. Next slide, please. So since we mentioned the school-based immunization, we should mention that we, there are opportunities to leverage daycares in schools. So many countries have already school-based immunization programs in place. And if so, it would be important to resume them as soon as possible um, because these programs are great opportunities to provide catch-up vaccination. And this has been, the next bullet's been emphasized quite a bit by Stephanie as well, but you know, for any vaccine series, but particularly for HPV in the school-based environment, it is still safe and efficacious to still provide and continue doses, even if the child's gone longer than the, the, the interval that's normally given for them. So she's already gone over that with example questions, so I won't dwell on it too much. And then for, for countries that have yet to use the school-based platform, there is an opportunity now to consider this as an innovation in your local setting to perhaps use it to provide misdoses or at minimum to even consider it just as a referral system to screen children and refer them to the health, um, the health center for catch up. Next slide, please. So this is our next poll questions. In your country of work, are vaccination records checked at entry to or during daycare preschool? And are vaccination track records checked at entry to or during primary school? All right, so I've launched the polling again and it should be up right now. And I'm continuing to see people commenting in the chat, a great presentation. Uh, there is this comment from Carolina Datovaro that I really want to read, which is a key message of this presentation. It is never too late to vaccinate. And uh, many people are thanking you, Samir and Stephanie, for uh, the wonderful presentation, great presentation. Absolutely great for Maruf Banabas. Uh, great presentation house, you know, from someone that didn't identify himself. Uh, thanks, I enjoyed this training from Ibrahim Yawaji. So uh, over 60% in the room have uh, voted. So I'll end the polling now, Samir. Yes, that's fine. Okay. So we can see it's about 50-50 for both questions. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting good mix that we have of participants here, those who've had this experience and those who have yet to have that experience. And so if there's any... Um, anecdotes or experiences that can be shared in the q and I think it might be helpful for those who haven't had those experiences. And I'm sure for those who do have these programs in place, um, I'm sure there are challenges that are going on there. And so that could also be avenues of discussion as well. So we can move on to the next slide. So what I've covered so far are basic strategies of catch-up vaccination that can be used um, for, in your routine immunization program. But given the current situation and given how in some countries the disruptions have been fairly significant or severe, you may need to address very large immunity gaps. 
And that's where you may want to consider mass vaccination campaigns. Um, if you are considering mass vaccination campaigns, there's some key considerations. One, in the current environment, we need to consider the ability to safely deliver mass vaccination while still minimizing the risk for COVID-19 transmission. And you also need to factor that there are additional costs to taking those, those considerations of play, to play, into taking those things into consideration, which includes the cost of the PPE, the cost of perhaps extending the time of the campaign to allow um, more physical distancing to occur. In addition, it's important to try to at, to at least tailor those campaigns to high risk areas, or at least ensure that the high risk areas are included in these campaigns. Um, because of the COVID scenario, as I mentioned earlier, you may need to increase the length or duration of the campaign, as well as the number of sites to help reduce crowding. But of course, that does come with extra costs. Um, you should consider setting up sites away from health centers, ideally in open air spaces or well-ventilated areas to help reduce the chance of transmission of COVID-19. And we always say this to try to integrate with multiple antigens and with other interventions, but it's more important now than ever before because these disruptions are not restricted to immunization. These disruptions have affected every health service and there's only limited opportunities we are having to reach these communities to provide as much health as we can. So in addition to immunization or in addition to particular antigens, if there's any opportunity and if there's any feasibility to provide additional services, we should definitely do that because where we do not have so many opportunities moving forward. Next slide, please. So I was discussing mass vaccination campaigns in general, but it's very important to know that there are different types of mass vaccination campaigns. So on one end, we have the PERIs, the Periodic Intensification of Routine Immunization. This is campaigns that are designed to deliver specifically routine immunizations rapidly and on a large scale or to an expanded target. Um, the, the important distinctions here is that when you have a period campaign, only the eligible individuals are vaccinated. That's, be, that's because we actually screen the children through their home-based records to see what vaccines are needed. If no vaccine is needed based on their home-based record, we do not necessarily vaccinate. We, so therefore, we need to ensure there's a sufficient stock of home-based records, ideally at baseline, you need to have it in the community, but you also need to be prepared to provide replacement of home-based records during these campaigns as well. And very importantly, you must record and report all of the doses as routinization doses. These doses do count as official routinization doses. The other campaign strategy that's commonly used that I think most of you are familiar with are supplementary immunization activities. And these may be appropriate if you have a particular urgency to vaccinate a large number of individuals with specific antigens, particularly those that are prone to outbreaks such as measles. And here you, you do it without any regard to, to vaccination status. You do not um, actually screen them. You just vaccinate everyone within the eligible age group. It is a less efficient process because you may be vaccinating a child who's already been vaccinated before, but is logistically much easier to do and allows you to cover more of a geographical area because of that. Um, when you consider these SIAs, it is important to think about any existing campaigns that may be planned. So you may be thinking, for instance, of a measles campaign, but if the country or if your general area is also considering a yellow fever campaign not far from then, you may wanna consider that as an opportunity to integrate those antigens to increase your efficiency, efficiency, reduce burden, reduce cost as well. But that's provided if it's feasible. Next slide, please. So to help you in this decision-making, there are two WHO references for you to consider. Um, the first one I wanna point out on the left is a framework for decision-making, um, implementation of mass vaccination campaigns in the context of COVID-19. This allows you to weigh out the risks and benefits of doing a campaign versus the risks of transmission of COVID-19. So if you go through this framework, it helps you decide whether those benefits outweigh the, the benefits of the campaign outweigh the risks of the COVID-19. If you subsequently decide that it makes sense to go ahead and do that campaign, you may still have a challenge to decide which campaign you may want to um, do first, if you're doing an SIA, which antigens you may want to do first if you're un unable to integrate them. And if that's the case, then the second guidance document here, vaccination in acute humanitarian emergencies, 
it was developed a few years ago, but it is applicable in the setting for that type of decision making to allow you to decide which antigens should be prioritized first. Next slide, please. So we've gone over different strategies on the routine immunization side and as well as in campaigns that you may need to think about and consider. And there's really no one size fits all for everyone. So we can't simply say, if this, you must do that. I think it's a, it's a complicated process and you gotta weigh and balance out several different factors. So this slide helps show the different types of factors that you need to consider in your decision-making. Um, and I'm gonna go through these boxes um, one by one. So in your upper left quadrant, um, these are essentially your epidemiological principles, right? Your local epidemiology of the outbreak prone diseases. Um, what is the pre-existing population immunity? What's the duration and extent of the disruptions? These factors help lean whether you might wanna more urgently go toward a, a campaign versus feel sufficiently that routine immunization alone can be able to address your catch up needs. As well as you may wanna look at your, your target population in terms of age and geography and consider um, access issues as well. In the upper right quadrant, these are more the logistical issues you need to take in consideration. The human and financial resources, which are becoming strained in the COVID world, unfortunately. Um, and also there's extra costs that we need to take into consideration right now in the COVID scenario. Um, you need to consideration your vaccine stocks and supplies, the availability of home-based records, which may affect whether you feel like you're, you can successfully do a PIRI, um, and any integration opportunity and its feasibility. In the bottom left quadrant, these are really your COVID factors that you must consider that we never really had to think about a year ago, but now is something that should be part of all of our thinking. What are the risks related to ongoing COVID transmission in your community? Um, what are the physical distancing requirements in place? and what infection prevention and control measures are needed, including all those additional costs. And then finally, in that fourth quadrant on the bottom right are demand and acceptance issues, which is, of course, critically important. Um, any local contextual issues, such as the weather, the um, security, political events. And of course, equity should be a factor in all of our thinking to make sure that the, the populations most in need are the ones getting the, the, the services. So the next few slides cover some of these principles in a little more detail, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna dwell on all of these. I just wanna highlight them so you can refer to them down the road. So this slide goes over the, how to assess the extent of disruption to determine the scale of the catch-up required. Next slide, please. This slide helps you calculate and estimate the target population for catch-up based on your administrative data. Next slide, please. This slide goes over in, um, ensuring the availability of vaccines and supplies. And I just wanna highlight the last bullet at the bottom is that there is a new WHO UNICEF joint statement on the safe integration of cold chain. Next slide, please. Um, this slide talks about the importance to mitigate the risk, um, risk mitigation to reduce wastage. Um, so the principle of first, first expiration, first out still applies, but it's cr more critically important now because um, more vaccines have been sitting on the shelf during disruption time periods and are closer to expiration date. So we need to be very mindful of it. Um, and because of this, there's also as a temporary measure, um, there's been a waiving of requirements to help minimum shelf life. So UNICEF and suppliers are now starting to plan shipments with mixed, uh, with a mix of reduced shelf life vaccines for immediate use and longer shelf life doses. What that means for all of you is that you need to be more aware to check the expiration date of your vaccines to make sure those expiring first are being prioritized for immediate use. It's important because if we let these vaccines expire, we're at risk for some um, significant um, stockouts down the road. Um, also, there's an to go back just one second, just want to highlight that there's a new WHO UNICEF joint statement on optimizing the use of vaccines that will be coming out soon. Next slide. And then it's always important to think about demand and trust. Um, it's a particular problem now because despite whatever pre-existing issues may have been existing in your communities, um, there's increased anxiety about COVID-19 transmission as well. So it's important to have some tailored messages. I just want to highlight these three messages before we move on. Um, one, it's important to emphasize the value of vaccines and the importance of catching up on any missed doses. Two, to provide information on when services are resuming if they were stopped. 
and also any changes and adaptations that you may have made, any updated timing or schedules or locations of your services so that people are aware of these opportunities to get vaccinated. And then you need to assure them that you've taken all these protective measures, all these IPC measures, that they're in place to ensure a safe environment at the health facility to have that the, there's low risk for transmission of COVID in these facilities. So next slide, please. I will conclude with some showing you our references. Next slide. So the, the first one was the um, reference to the catch-up vaccination. And then here, there you go. Um, and then here is a TechNet website that has all of our guidance at global and regional level related to immunization of COVID-19. It's a useful website for all of you if you want to look up any references, um, easy to find that way. So that, I believe that concludes our slides. Thank you, everyone. Okay, really, thank you very much, Stephanie and uh, Samir for this wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, we have up to 25 questions on the chat, so, uh, uh, on the Q&A, sorry. And uh, so many comments on the chat that I won't have uh, enough time to read all of them. So uh, we have uh, the last 20 minutes of this session dedicated uh, to the questions and answers. So directly, I'm going to go uh, to the Q&A and I'll invite uh, participants to continue to do the voting, but we have uh, some questions uh, that have uh, had uh, the highest vote. Uh, there is this question from Martin uh, Tullio uh, that has been liked 11 times. He wanted to ask what is the maximum age limit for catch-up vaccination? And I think it's connected. There's another question that has to do with what is catch-up that can you explain? Maybe some people didn't uh, uh, understand uh, very clearly. So uh, over to you, Samir, Stephanie. Hi, so yes, thank you. I, can you, yeah, can you can hear me? Um, so I did see that there were sort of some iterations of that question that came up a number of times. And so in order to support my answer, I just wanna go back to this slide because this is a really important resource that will help answer um, a lot of the questions that have been coming up about specific antigens and upper age limits. Because of course there's not, it's not a one size fits all and there's not one answer that applies across the board for you know, upper age limits. Um, every vaccine, every antigen um, requires a different schedule for you know, the best immunogenic response. And so WHO has vaccine position papers for all of the antigens, as I'm sure you all know. And WHO has summarized basically all the recommendations across all of the vaccine position papers into these summary tables, which can be found at this link here. And this particular summary table summarizes the recommendations for late vaccination. So it does cover the, it will probably answer most of the questions that you have. Um, it covers the minimum age that each vaccine should be, can be given. Um, it covers the minimum intervals between doses to make sure that you get the appropriate immune response for each of those um, antigens. And if an upper age limit applies, uh, then it covers that as well. In fact, there is not really an upper age limit recommended by WHO or maximum age limit for most antigens. There are a few exceptions to this, the birth dose antigens, for example. I did see that came up a few times. Uh, birth dose antigens, by definition, have an upper age limit because they are meant to be given within the birth or immediate like sort of postnatal period. And because of the, the nature of those antigens, there will be an effective upper age limit. For example, hepatitis B birth dose the, the recommendations from WHO is to give it within 24 hours, and then if not possible within 24 hours, as soon as possible thereafter. But then ultimately you have the first dose of hepatitis that's usually recommended at six weeks or two months in some countries. And so in order to ensure the appropriate interval that's required between um, doses of hepatitis, it effectively means that your upper window for birth dose stops at, in some cases, two weeks in order to make sure there's enough time for that six week dose. So this also highlights the specificity of this for each immunization program, because it really depends on your overall schedule um, when making these determinations of whether or not there needs to be a national policy for an upper age limit. The other thing to take into consideration is the local epidemiology, because even though there's no um, WHO recommendation that a vaccine should be stopped at any age, countries will have to make decisions um, based on their local epidemiology of disease transmission, whether it makes sense to keep giving vaccines over a certain age when the bulk of the burden or 
um, most of the burden is under certain age groups. So it highlights the importance of getting your national advisory, uh, your NITAGs involved in these decisions and other um, advisory committees in the country and reviewing all the data available along with your national schedule to create a catch-up schedule that makes sense for your country in line with your national immunization schedule. Um, Samir, do you wanna add anything to that? Actually, I think you covered it really well. Nothing to add on my end. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you, uh, Samir and Stephanie. So there is this question that got nine uh, uh, likes from uh, Caroline Masunda that says, uh, in a couple of countries that I've worked, I have so many children who are above five years and have never va been vaccinated due to conflicts. Talk of Nigeria, Bono State, South Sudan. How best can we make sure that the children receive their vaccines in time? In these areas also we experience severe measles outbreak. Well, there's not a, um, especially when we're talking about measles, there's not a epidemiological or biological reason why those children cannot be vaccinated to Stephanie's point earlier. There's not the maximum age limit for vaccination. So they can't theoretically be vaccinated. And, you know, we would, we would like to have a vision of the world where children can get these vaccines throughout the life course um, and not be have necessary age limits to get vaccinated. I think that should be an aspiration we all work toward. Um, there is challenges, however, because you have to respect the guidance within your own country and every country has different guidance as to when they should be vaccinated and they may have in place a maximum age limit. Um, but most of that is pretty much, all of that's not really based on necessary epidemiological needs, it's usually based on other logistical considerations. Um, if any of you are in positions where you can influence those policies, we would recommend encouraging a reconsideration of some of those maximum age limits, especially in the current situation. Um, in Stephanie's slide, she highlighted, you know, to at least have a consideration in given the urgency of the situation to have at least an interim relaxing of some of those maximum age limits so that they can be vaccinated through routine systems um, because we recognize the challenges of making these changes over the longer term. But there is an urgency now. So if changes can be made in systems now to allow these children to be vaccinated sooner um, and through the routine program, it makes sense. Otherwise, we tend to historically depend on these SIAs and campaigns to reach these children. Um, but you know, that's not an ideal scenario. We don't want to depend on only one mechanism to vaccinate these children. So if we can move toward getting them vaccinated routine systems too, that would be more effective. Stephanie, do you have anything else to add? No, that was okay. very comprehensive. All right, so I'll just go directly to the next question. It has from uh, Benedict Paul, it has to do with data. Say, how can you measure or ascertain the efficacy of the vaccine? No, that's not the question. That's please, uh, Shendel can explain how we can add the catch up with the regular data for those to, op uh, to obtain at the right time and how do we relate the data? It's Daniel Aruna. I don't know if he's still in the room. Uh, is the question quite clear or should I invite him to unmute himself and answer more clearly? I think I understand what he's asking, but of course, if this is not the right answer, then he can <laughs> feel free to, to jump in and correct. And I suspect that, um, you know, this question was asked probably midway through the presentation and uh, before we had gone to it. And also because Samir, just given that we ran out of time, needed to accelerate through those last few slides. But we did include a slide at the end, so I encourage you to go look at it um, about a suggested method for um, a, using your data to sort of estimate the target for catch up and how to add that to your normal target. So I think this is what, um, what, what is what's being asked. And this is what's been done in a lot of countries over the past few months um, in order to kind of monitor the situation on an ongoing basis to see um, exactly how much these service interruptions are impacting the coverage. And so the one of the recommended methods to do this is to look at your immunization coverage for the same period last year. So if you're looking at um, your monthly immunization data for um, March, April, May, June, July from 2019, compare that to your data that you have now. It will give you an idea of you know, how many individuals are being missed out due to this um, service interruptions. And then that gives you an estimate, an estimate of the target population that you need to actually focus on for catching up in addition to your regular targets for your monthly, um, your monthly data. So it's a, this is kind of the, a quick and dirty way that a lot of countries are using in order to gauge the extent of this disruption and uh, reevaluate their, their targets for subsequent months. I hope that answers the question. I hope so too. Yeah. But I... Yes, 
Yes, I'm good. Yes, I think it really gives me an, an, an insight to it. Yes, Shandel, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Daniel. That was Daniel Haruna. Okay, so uh, we are just a little bit over 10 minutes to the end of the session, and there is a question with the recommendation from Carolina Datuvaro. It's a question on IPV that I think it's pertinent uh, to be handled during this session. It's from Dr. Sida Lingaya HS. And forgive me if I don't get your name right. It says, catching up vaccination policy is mostly based on vaccine supply and benefits at later age. For example, IPV, if missed at recommended age, is missed forever, if not given below one year of age. Though the benefits of IPV exist beyond one year, what to do in such cases? Well, I, I, he's correct. One of the biggest considerations that affect the government policies is the concerns of vaccine supply and trying to ensure that there's no stockout. So um, those are considerations that are factored into those decisions. Um, the, the chart that Stephanie showed earlier, the WHO table, that's based on the biology, the epidemiology of when it can still be a benefit. And you, as Stephanie pointed out, there's benefit to the vaccines occurring later in life um, with no maximum age limits for most of the vaccines. Um, but when you have countries who put those limits in place, it's because of those considerations and concerns about stockouts. Um, however, we have a growing recognition of the programmatic importance and need to vaccinate um, throughout the life course, and that we wanna try to minimize the, the, the use of maximum age limits. And often in practice, there's actually minimal impact to the forecasting if you have this in regular practice, because as Stephanie pointed out in her presentation, you forecast based on your target population. So if you've missed a few kids along the way, they were part of the original estimate. So granted in the beginning, you may have an increased um, surge or need for vaccine, but over the long run, it shouldn't really have a long-term impact on, for, on your forecasting needs. If there is a little bit of an impact, um, I think it's fair for us to ask our programs to, and our policymakers to consider forecasting for that. And you know, to meet the immunization needs of our communities, if it means we need more vaccine forecasting to, to be there for these readily available vaccines, I think it's a fair expectation. The challenge is for certain vaccines such as IPV, that there has been a global supply issue. And that's why there's been some stricter um, age restrictions there. But as we anticipate over the next year or two, this supply situation to improve, we hope that countries will consider lightening up those restrictions on vaccines that, such as IPV. Stephanie, anything else? Great, thank you, uh, Samir. The next question, I'm coming back to the question from Benedict Paul. I say, how can you measure or ascertain the efficacy of the vaccine after delay, especially for those vaccines that require more than one dose? I would recommend not to try to twist ourselves to do the to try to think that way. I think we should try to keep this as simple as possible for ourselves, and just as importantly for our programs and all the way down to the health worker level. And the simple principle is, you should always vaccinate when there's an opportunity to vaccinate, and it's better to vaccinate late than never. Um, there's really less of a concern about the immunization benefit of vaccinating later. Um, the reason why we have um, these minimum ages is that's the earliest point you can have immunization benefit. The benefit can occur later on in life as well, but we want people to get the immunity as soon as possible. So we put emphasis to please vaccinate your child, you know, perhaps measles at nine months of age, depending on your program, because we want that child to have immunity, Im immunity and protection as early as possible. But if they receive it later, that's it still will provide protection from that point forward. So I would recommend that we try not to think about it in terms of whether there's still an immunogenic effect. There is. Um, it's just more of a question of how can we get it there as soon as possible to ensure immunity as quickly as possible. Stephanie, did you have anything else to add? Just to just to add that you know this this is all accounted for in the WHO vaccine position paper is when the recommended schedules are are put forward. It also and the summary table that I showed earlier, also showing the, the minimum intervals and any maximum intervals, if there are any. And for, by and large, most vaccines, there isn't a maximum interval for that very reason, because you still get that immunological benefit, even if there is a longer space between the doses. There are a few, very few exceptions to that, cholera vaccine being one of them, that if a certain amount of time has passed since the first dose, then you do have to revaccinate. But that's a very, that's a, you know, a very narrow exception 
Um, and all of that is laid out in that table because it's antigen by antigen. But for all of the routine vaccinations that we're talking about in most of our EPI schedules, there is no maximum interval. You still get that dose um, immunologically. You still get that benefit immunologically, even if it's late. And so, you know, that's why those recommendations are in place to just vaccinate. Okay, so thank you, Samir and Stephanie. Uh, and I really want to thank all of you who have been asking uh, questions on the Q&A and in the chat, but due to time constraints, we may not be able to take all of them. So we are going to take one last question, uh, still from Dr. Sidalingaya, and then we'll want to listen to one or two participants. So those who raise hands, we are going to invite them to intervene. So uh, the question uh, is, uh, most important challenge in catch-up vaccination is to decide what to, what to do when past vaccination history and timelines are unavailable. What is the best decision in this order than, other than restarting uh, the vaccination? Yeah, I can start with that and, and then let Samir. So uh, agreed, that is a huge challenge and that is um, a significant barrier in a lot of places, specifically because, um, as we know, home-based records are not always widely available and, um, uh, and reliable immunization registries are sometimes not reliable either. And so this definitely is a problem. Um, it's one of the reasons why we are trying so hard to promote the um, importance of safeguarding home-based records and recording doses, all doses in those home-based records so that we improve these data systems and that we run into this problem less frequently in the future. Um, the current recommendation is though, if you don't have vaccination history, you should assume that that individual is not vaccinated and revaccinate because ultimately it's better to be safe than sorry. And there's no harm in revaccinating. If somebody has been vaccinated and they get vaccinated again from a safety and an efficacy perspective, there's no harm in that. Of course, some people don't want to be revaccinated. That's understandable, and you should never force that upon someone. But that is the recommendation because it's better to be safe than sorry. Um, but then, you know, the other suggestions that um, that we have is to try to do sort of everything you can to ascertain that history. If there's any way to contact the health center that that person was at previously, if there's any way to um, to ascertain that history in another manner, then try. But you know, ultimately, if there is no record, then um, then revaccinating is the is the recommendation. Samir, the only thing I'd add is that um, if you do revaccinate under those circumstances, um, please take that opportunity to give them another home based record at that point in time, and. It, you know, it highlights that we need to have sufficient supplies of the home based records in every health facility, um, and even in outreach visits as well, to allow us to do that. And um, we shouldn't. Um, always blame the parents or the caregivers if these home-based records are not available. I, I've seen situations where an entire community did not, an entire village did not have home-based records and it wasn't the village's fault. It, there was flooding that occurred and these records were just paper-based systems and were not durable enough and they all got flooded and lost. And so we should be a little more sympathetic and empathetic to the needs of the community um, and be prepared to provide replacements at all times. We should always have buffer stocks of these, um, of these items. All right, so thank you, Samir and uh, Stephanie, and uh, you're getting appreciation from uh, those who ask the questions on the chat that they, are get, they have gotten the answers, clear answer to their, their questions. And so right now I see Rukaya Haruna, your hand is raised. Uh, so if you can unmute yourself, I don't know if you have a question or you want to share an experience. There's also Ms. Melesi Teferi, if you can... Uh, unmute yourself, just want to listen to one participant before the end of uh, the session. We also have uh, Okech Emmanuel. So all the hands that are raised, I'm giving you the possibility to unmute yourself. The first person, okay, I see Melissa Teferi, you're unmuted, please, uh, hello to you. Can you introduce yourself and uh, tell us where you're calling in from and what is your question or your concern? Melissa Teferi. Okay, so uh, there is uh, also a prudence. So anyone, if you're the first person to unmute, you'll be able to, you have the floor to speak. So prudence, Boadi. Unfortunately, we are not getting any of you. Hello. Yeah, hello. Okay, hello, hello. prudence. Hello. Yes, hello, prudence. Uh, so please yeah. go ahead, introduce yourself. 
I'm, I'm Prudence Boydi from Ghana. Uh, please, um, I just want to add a little contribution based on the parents who are defaulting. Uh, Unfortunately, Prudence, your internet connection seems to be uh, disturbing. So we are not able to hear you. Okay, let's try again. Oh, unfortunately, uh, we're not. Uh, uh, Prudence, since we can't get you, you may, we may want to. Hello, Prudence, you may want to type in your contribution in the chat and then I'll do myself the pleasure to read out your contribution, please. Would I really love to hear from you? Unfortunately, internet connection, it doesn't permit and it happens to all of us most of the time. Uh, Nuhu Sani, there is Nuhu Sani. Uh, Kaul, yes. okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Oh, Nuhu Sani, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh -huh. good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nohusani from Nigeria, KB State, that's the local government. I'm a immunization, routine immunization officer. Uh, basically, I'm, the, I didn't, I'm not understanding the first presenter, what she's saying rightly. But the second presenter, I'm understanding him fully. But uh, what I want to ask here is that uh, in the case of catch-up campaign, then how do we go about the adverse event following the follow after the immunization? How are we going to handle them and how to take care of all those things in the case of catch up campaign? So that is the questions that I have. Yeah. All right, thank you, Nuhu, for your question. Uh, Samir? My apologies, I didn't hear the question well. Um, Charlotte, can you repeat the question for me maybe? So uh, I didn't get him clearly either, but it had to do with, uh, so no, if you can unmute yourself and come again, it had to do with decisions concerning catch up campaign. So no, can you ask your question again, please? There's yes, a bit I of can. background. Okay, please go yes, ahead. I can ask. And I said now, on the case of catch up campaign, you know, in each and every vaccination, there must be an adverse event following immunization, that is AEFI. So how are we going to handle all those cases in when doing the catch-up campaign? That is, that is my question. Now, as I told you earlier, I have even read it in the chat now that the first presenter, I'm not clearly hearing what she's saying, she's saying. But the second presenter, then I all heard what he said. So the question is on the AFI case, how are we going to handle it or take care of those AFI cases when it's happened during the catch-up campaign? So I understand. So I, if I understand correctly, you're concerned about AFI because it's obviously an important topic when we do our SIAs. Um, for instance, like a measles SIA, we put a lot of thought and um, effort into making sure we have a good AFI system. But now when we're talking about multiple antigens for a catch-up campaign, such as for a PIRI and such, I think you're concerned about being that there's more antigens at play, how do we manage our AFI system? And, and I think you know the basic principles of the AFI system will remain the same regardless of the number of antigens. I think the other factor to take, keep in mind is that when you plan um, these um, multi-antigen campaigns, particularly the PIRIs, because it requires um, vaccination screening and making sure you have the the, the processes in place to record and report and ensuring you have the appropriate vaccinators, they, they tend to be logistically a little more complicated and they require more time for planning. And with that extra time for planning, you also have extra time for the AFI planning as well. So you, you, you do take that into consideration in your decision-making as to which campaign approach you wanna take moving forward. But the benefit of that is that you are able to cover way more antigens and health interventions if you can do that. I hope that answered it well. All right, so thank you, Nuhu, Sunny, for your question. And we are sorry if you weren't getting, didn't get the first part of the presentation well, but just to reassure you, the recording and uh, the slide deck uh, will be made available for you. And right now, I'm just uh, pasting the link to the resource folder uh, on the chat. 
And now there are uh, so many comments. I really do want to thank you all for your comments and for those that have raised their hands. Sorry, we may not be able to take you because we are already over time. But there was this comment on the chat from Niklas Danielson that I want to read out. He said, there is a private market for home-based records in Kenya. Entrepreneurs print and sell them to parents who can't get them from the public health centers. Uh, Sami, I don't know if uh, that's an experience you've heard about, uh, uh, a strategy you've heard about, and can it be encouraged? So um, we would discourage the private market for home-based records. Uh, any ex we, immunization should be a free service. And it, when there is a charge or a fee for a home-based record, um, sometimes that's done as a mechanism to gain some revenue. Um, it's not ideal because it causes a deterrent for parents to get those home-based records. It ends up being a, um, having a negative impact in getting children vaccinated in the long run. So we strongly discourage that practice to occur. We are aware that unfortunately it does occur in many settings for a variety of reasons that are very complicated, but we do not encourage that. It is not a recommended practice um, to, to charge parents for home-based records as well as, for, as well as for vaccines. Thank you, Sami. Stephanie, anything to add? No, just to, to highlight that, you know, the black market steps in or the private market steps in when there's a gap um, in the public delivery. So it's really, it's really on um, governments and on immunization programs to ensure that these home-based records are available um, through the public delivery system free of charge so that there doesn't create this type of private market um, that requires parents to pay for them. Okay, really, thank you very much. I'll, right now, I want to turn uh, towards uh, Jamil uh, that has been here from the start uh, 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 of this session and has been contributing on the chat. So uh, Jamil, what are your final words uh, for the session before, and then we'll turn to Samir and uh, Stephanie. Yeah, th thank you, Charlotte. Um, and I want to first thank all uh, the two presenters, um, as you saw that they put in a lot of effort in preparing the slide sets, which are full of information. And I really hope that you would go back to the slide sets. Uh, uh, we will put, uh, we provided you with the link. We are going to put the slide set and the recording for this uh, webinar uh, on that link. And I, I hope you will take some time also share it with some of your colleagues because these are some of the issues mentioned require a dialogue and policy framework. So it would be good to have some discussion within your country about these important issues, particularly as they relate to um, restarting, rebuilding uh, immunization and catching up on um, children that were missed uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. I also encourage you to, um, uh, those of you who are doing the GRISP course to think about these issues, as well as the issues that we discussed in the previous webinar on gender and think through those when you're preparing for your uh, particular plans. Um, again, thank you. Sorry, we went a little bit over time and I really thank you for your participation. Um, over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Jamil. A final word, Stephanie, Samir. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, no, just to say thank you again to everybody. And, um, you know, Jill Mill already hit most of the points that I was going to say. Um, this does require a dialogue. So please do share within your within your countries and your programs. And, and also just to remember that, you know, catch up vaccination while the spotlight is on it now. It's, a, it's, it's been a problem and a challenge um, before the pandemic. It will be a problem and a challenge after the pandemic if we don't actually start uh, putting these system enablers in place in order to improve that um, and make sure that that programs are are resilient to these types of interruptions in the future so um, that's just the final word for me on that and happy to answer any further questions that come up after this and from my end I, I would like to just first begin I was just scanning the chat and I saw one interesting comment from Nicholas Danielson from, from UNICEF that I just want to highlight when we were discussing reasons why these maximum age limits are, are in place in countries and he pointed out that it's not just because of policies or fear stockouts etc it's sometimes just institutionalized practices and sometimes those practices have been ingrained because of our reporting systems so when Stephanie showed how you can adjust your tally sheets you know, and show that you can document doses being given at 12 months or older. If you don't have those kind of options available, I think 
even if a policy is in place, the practice may not change. So it sends a message to the health worker that it's okay to vaccinate beyond a certain age. So I just want to highlight that, you know, to Stephanie's point, you know, catch up immunization is an important principle that goes beyond COVID. Um, but a lot of that needs to be institutionalized uh, as quickly as possible and it requires some cultural changes in how we operate and how we think. And it needs a rethink of our entire system, including our data systems, when we make those changes all across the board rather than just issue a, a one policy, but actually have a change in everything we do and how we think about things. That's the only way the change will actually happen. So I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to Stephanie and I go on and on and on and on. Um, it was a joy for us to do this. And uh, like Stephanie, happy to help answer any questions offline afterwards too. Thank you, everyone. All right, so uh, thank you, Samir Soda and Stephanie Shendel. And for you who want to know more about uh, catch-up vaccination, uh, Stephanie uh, will be our guest, uh, Reda and I, tomorrow uh, for a lightning chat on Facebook Live. So make it a date and you can come attend and ask all of the other questions that are left unanswered uh, today. So I really want to thank you. Uh, we haven't listened to many participants, but it has been very interactive on the chat and the Q&A. So we thank you for that. And Sorry again for taking 10 minutes over your time, but it's been a pleasure last week and this week for us to have this WHO Greece special event. And we do hope that they have been helpful and they'll be useful for you in your day to day work. So have a nice uh, day, have a nice afternoon, nice evening and nice night, depending on where you're joining from. And uh, as we say in the scholar community, we are together, or better in French, only ensemble. Bye for now. <laughs>